one of the most important and impactful decisions you will ever make and one of the most important and impactful relationships that you will ever have in your life is your spouse. You're right to make a big deal about this, well, at least as a Christian, because as followers of Christ, we take marriage extremely seriously as it is a pact or covenant relationship between one another and with God himself. Did you ever consider the vows that are stated during a marriage? We say for rich or poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. But for many people, the covenant that is made between us and God is simply words. We say them because we have to, but secretly, we don't really mean them. So many times we say, I do, until one of us gets really sick. Or until you no longer satisfy me or bring me pleasure. Or until you burn the toast or, or you get the beer belly, and then we're through. But what you need to know is that in a God-honoring relationship and a God-honoring marriage, marriage is absolutely an important decision and a covenant relationship that we make before God. And as we jump into today's passage, we go into it with this in mind, that who you marry, who you choose to be, your spouse, is one of the most, if not the most important decision in your life after putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So we don't treat it lightly. Today, we've got a lot to cover. So buckle up, grab your Bibles, open your Bible app, grab your message notes, and get ready to dig in. All right, we're picking it up in chapter 3 of Song of Songs, beginning in verse 6. Now, on a few occasions, we get this additional voice that chimes in in the book. The voice is listed as the narrator in your Bibles. Um, what's important is not so much who is saying it, but what is being described. Okay, so let's pick it up in chapter 3, verse 6, and let's read. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, scented with myrrh and frankincense, from every fragrant powder of the merchants? Look, Solomon's bed surrounded by 60 warriors from the mighty men of Israel. All of them are skilled with swords and trained in warfare. Each has its sword at his side to guard against the terror of the night. King Solomon made a carriage for himself with wood from Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple. Its interior is inlaid with love by the young women of Jerusalem. Go out, young women of Zion, and gaze at King Solomon, wearing the crown his mother placed on him on the day of his wedding, the day of his heart's rejoicing. Now, this is quite the spectacle and fanfare that is being described of Solomon. It mentions smoke, carriages, warriors, gold, and crowns. This passage has been interpreted a couple different ways. And I'll give you the question I think it brings to mind in just one second. But first, it begins describing Solomon, almost like coming from behind a cloud of smoke. And then it says that he smells like myrrh and frankincense and fragrant powder. So my boy is looking good. And my boy is smelling good. And fellas, you already know where I'm going with this. And I know I mentioned it already previously. Uh, if you're single and ready to mingle, take a shower. Spray some cologne. Use the odor and shave. Make an effort because women like that. If you're married, don't get complacent. Look good for your wife. All the same stuff applies for you. But maybe you can ask her, baby, which cologne do you like? Which one drives you wild? Fellas, take care of your grooming. Shave your face, tidy your beard. Maybe consider going from one eyebrow to two, maybe. Uh, come on, fellas. Swerve got to have, uh, got to be the spot for some of the best-looking, well-kept, well-groomed, Jesus-loving men in all of Bushwick. What do you guys say? Ladies, you can thank me later, okay? Well, here's what the passage describes. This strong carriage made from beefy wood. It describes warriors with swords that ain't nobody going to mess with. And one of the big ideas that it's describing is this idea of safety and protection. It gives assurance to Jasmine and her family that she is being taken care of and protected by her man. And that's exactly what a marriage should feel like. So the question that I want us to ask ourselves this morning is this. Is your marriage a safe space? In a God-honoring marriage, for both parts of the couple, it should feel like a safe and guarded space. There's protection from without and also within. Now, fellas, Solomon is addressed in this passage as having the primary responsibility of making sure that his beloved is safe, protected, and guarded. And while in a marriage there should be mutual guarding, Solomon has the primary responsibility. The Bible describes women as the weaker vessel in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which means that as men, we should be, uh, her, we should be here to help 
not hurt her. Yet how often, forget about our culture, right here in our community, do we see men abuse their strength and power over their women to hurt and harm physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually? Men, are you guarding your marriage? Are you protecting your spouse? Are you protecting her against gossip and slander? Or when your friends at work, are you telling them, do you know what dumb thing my wife did this week? Are you protecting her against sarcasm and disrespectful speech? Or are you verbally abusing her, answering with sarcastic words, talking down to her, insulting her with your words? Are you protecting her against violence and getting harmed? Which means that you don't send her out at 10 o'clock at night to get a gallon of milk because you don't feel like getting changed or because the game is on and you don't want to leave. When she's with you, does she feel like she's protected, guarded, and cared for against danger? And of course, men, don't you ever use your strength in a way to dominate, intimidate, or physically harm her. Don't you ever dare do that. To my single or not yet married people, if you're dating and your relationship isn't a safe space, what makes you think things will change when you get married and have kids? Don't be a fool. If you're only dating and the relationship is already showing patterns of abuse, get the heck out now. And ladies, while Solomon is addressed here, it goes both ways. While perhaps you don't physically protect your man, your words and actions can either build him up or tear him down. And what that means is for both parties, there is a responsibility to guard and protect one's marriage. Next, Solomon goes on to give a detailed description of Jasmine's beauty and ever so smooth with it, with the words, okay? Here's what he says. How beautiful you are, my darling, how very beautiful. Behind your veil, your eyes are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep coming up from washing, each one bearing twins, and none has lost its young. Your lips are like scarlet cord and your mouth is lovely. Behind your veil, your brow is like a slice of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David constructed in layers. A thousand shields are hung on it, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will make my way to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. You are absolutely beautiful, my darling. There is no imperfection in you. And here, Solomon describes her beauty. He mentions her eyes, her hair, which is dark, thick, and long. He mentions her teeth and her smile. And guess what? Each one has its twin. So she has all her teeth. And that's always a plus, right? <laughs> he mentions her lips, her cheeks being rosy like pomegranates, her long neck, which he's adorned with jewelry. And then he mentions her, um, <clears throat> her two fawns. And uh, he likes that too. He runs out this section saying there's no imperfection in you, which leads us to our next question. Is your spouse your standard of beauty? He says there is no imperfection in her. Now, do you think that's literally true? Listen, I've yet to meet someone as beautiful as they may look to not have a single imperfection. I mean, he describes as having a neck like the Tower of David. That's a pretty long neck, right? And what it means is that to him, she is the most beautiful and no one else can capture his attention the way that she can. She's reciprocated this sentiment other times throughout the book as well. She is his standard of handsomeness. And the same should be said of us. Your spouse is your standard of beauty. If she has a long neck, guess what? You're really into long necks. If he has big arms but skips leg day and his legs look like chicken legs, well, guess what? You must really like chicken. And you can lovingly encourage him to do some squats. <laughs> but the big idea is that your spouse is your standard of beauty. And here's the thing. You need to know this. Beauty is fleeting. Some of you think you're going to be on Instagram perfect forever. You're not. And I hate to break it to you. Your hair is going to turn gray or fall out. Your skin is going to sag. Your strength will wither away. Which is why in a marriage, your spouse should be your standard of beauty. And you connect on a deeper level than just the physical. And you can appreciate every nook and every cranny. And Solomon goes on to say this. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon, descend from the peak of Amana, from the summit of Senir and Hernan, from the dens of the lions, from the mountains of the leopards. You have captured my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captured my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful your caresses are, my sister, my bride. 
Your caresses are much better than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any balsam. Your lips drip sweetness like the honeycomb, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Solomon continues to pay compliments to his bride and says that she has captured his heart. He describes her caresses and how much he enjoys them. It seems like Solomon's love language is touch. He enjoys when she combs her fingers through his hair and cuddles and snuggles alongside of him. He describes her lips and how sweet her kisses are. He says honey and milk are under her tongue. How did he find that out? I don't know, maybe you know. He describes her smell, so she smells good as well. And in this passage, he introduces a new way of labeling her. Did you catch it? He calls her his sister and bride. And what this means is that for him, Jasmine isn't simply an object of his desires and a means to an end. The relationship that they have with one another is special, romantic, respectful, meaningful, and loving. And actually, he continues with this theme on in verse 12 and following. He says this, My sister, my bride, you are a locked garden, a locked garden and a sealed spring. Your branches are a paradise of pomegranates with choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the best spices. You are a garden spring, a well of flowing water streaming from Lebanon. She responds saying, awaken north wind, come south wind, blow on my garden and spread the fragrance of its spices. Let my love come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. And he says, I have come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spices. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. He calls her my sister and my bride. And I think the question that we can ask ourselves is this right here. You can write this down. Do you have a friendship with your spouse or your potential spouse? Four times Solomon calls Jasmine, uh, th- I'm sorry, three times Solomon calls, his, uh, calls Jasmine his sister and bride, referring to the intimate friendship that they have. And if you were to survey successful long-time marriages, what you will discover is that beyond a superficial, surface-level physical attraction, there is a profound friendship. What do friends do? They spend time with each other. They know how to have fun and what makes each other laugh. There is a tremendous amount of trust and know each other's secrets and weaknesses. They are there for each other when times get tough. There is mutual love and respect. If you're dating or actively praying or looking for a potential spouse, the best piece of advice that I can give you is to marry your best friend. Physical attraction can certainly be important, but it's not everything or the most important. Like I mentioned earlier, beauty is fleeting. And how you looked at 25 is not what you will look like at 52. And so often when it comes to looking for a potential spouse, we begin with, does he or she look good? Instead of asking, is he or she a good friend? What happens when you combine the physical attraction with the intimate friendship? Well, there's a whole lot of spices, honey, and milk. Now, I don't know if you guys caught this, but he says uh, of her in verse 12 that she is a locked garden. And what is that describing? It appears that we are taking a look at the honeymoon night after the wedding where she has kept herself pure and untouched. She has taken the covenant of marriage seriously. She's taken God and his design seriously and maintained her purity for her beloved, making her a locked garden. Which leads us to our next question. And you can also write this down. Are you keeping yourself pure until the right time? We've been reminded of this already several times throughout the book, and we are reminded here yet again not to stir up or awaken love until the right time. Until the right time, which is in covenant marriage before God and people, the disposition is to keep oneself for your beloved and them alone. And how beautiful is it when two people take God so seriously that they keep themselves pure and remain locked gardens until the proper time, which is within marriage. It's a beautiful thing and is a rare sight in today's day and age. However, when we stand against culture and for God's design, He is glorified. He blesses the relationship, but you also get to enjoy one another freely as intended. Now, if you're here today and you're like, well, Danny, that ship has sailed. 
Well, how about we take God and his word so seriously that if you're single, dating, or engaged, from this day forward, you make a pact with God to remain pure until the day that you get married. God is able to redeem that relationship and forgive that sin and bless that marriage. He's more than able. And for Solomon and Jasmine, they chose to remain pure and honor God. And she goes from a locked garden to a well of flowing water in verse 15 as their marriage is consummated. And what does God think about this? In the second half of verse 1 of chapter 5, we have a voice that speaks that is labeled as the voice of the narrator in your Bibles. But most scholars believe that it is God that interjects in this moment. And he says this, Eat, friends. Drink. Be intoxicated with caresses. Because it is within God's design, it is blessed by God himself. It is as he intended so they can feast. Within a God-honoring marriage, there is freedom, enjoyment, honey, milk, fawns, spices, and pomegranates. Have you catch my drift? But this union and the consummation of their love is celebrated and encouraged by God because it is within his design. Now, as we round out our time, I think you know where I'm going to go next. And that is we're going to ask the question, where is who? Where is Jesus? And yet again, he's all over the text, but allow me to make one connection. Solomon describes Jasmine as his bride and his friend. And this speaks to the intimacy in their relationship. It is akin to the relationship Adam and Eve had with God in the garden before the fall. Adam and Eve had a friendship with God where they freely communed with him. But that friendship, intimacy, and relationship was broken once they disobeyed God. That relationship was broken because of sin. And because we inherit that sinful nature, the Bible says that we are enemies of God and children of wrath. Because we are descendants of Adam and Eve, we too have this sin nature within us where our predisposition is to disobey, dishonor, and reject God. But God, who is rich in mercy, provides a way for our relationship with Him to be restored. And He does so through Jesus, who lives a perfect and sinless life. In order to absorb the wrath of God owed to us, He is punished and ultimately hung on a cross. His nail-pierced hands, a symbol of God's love for us. And on the cross, He died and they placed His body in the tomb, where three days later, He conquered the grave. And here's what his death on the cross and his victory over the grave does. It has the power to grant us forgiveness of sin and new life. And all we need to do to experience this amazing grace of God is accept his free gift made available through Jesus. And as Solomon entered triumphantly in his glory as a guardian and protector of his bride, Jesus enters triumphantly to protect those whom he loves from the enemy and our sin. And as a result, for all who put their faith in Jesus, the Bible says that we become, check this, the bride of Christ and friends of God. Our sin no longer separates us because Jesus has brought us near. That broken relationship is restored. Our intimacy with God is restored. We are welcomed into the proverbial palace of God because of Jesus. And all you have to do is repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus, and depend on his finished work. Are you guys able to catch the connection? I hope you did. Let's spend some time in prayer. God, I just pray that our marriages here in our church would be a safe space, that our marriages would be full of words of love and affirmation, that our men would be protectors and defenders, and that our marriages, that in our marriages, we would guard one another. I pray that you would empower us to remain pure, For those who are single or dating, give the strength to resist temptation and make a conscious decision to honor you over their passions and desires. I pray that within our marriages, there may be a tremendous amount of friendship and that the friendship would produce trust, intimacy, and passion. For the single and dating, help them find a potential spouse that can be a friend that they can relationally connect with. And Father, we praise you for Jesus who makes us his bride, and friends of God. And for that, we are eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.